This is David Papa, and this is the Personal Injury Guru Show. Now, for those of you who have heard the word chiropractic care, uh, you may have preconceived notions about what chiropractors do. Well, today, my goal is to bring in a chiropractor who's got over 30 years of experience. And what his job today is going to make sure that you understand what a chiropractor does. And also, his limitations on what he shouldn't do. And what we're going to get into with him is the types of manipulations that they do to the back and to the spine. Also, he's going to address situations where he's going to show you what disc injuries are. And he's going to uh, use a demonstrative aid to show you that. And at the same time, he's going to be talking about there's certain injuries that a chiropractor just can't fix. And he knows that. He knows his limitations. And he knows he might have to send somebody along for an MRI or a CAT scan. And he's also going to be able to talk a little bit about, hey, I might have to send this person to a pain management doctor or an orthopedic surgeon or possibly a neurosurgeon. And he's going to explain all these things to you. And I think it's important that people know what a chiropractor does because people who get into automobile accidents, a lot of people need chiropractic care. And if you don't believe in a chiropractor, that's perfectly fine. But for those who are not so sure and they're still a little bit tentative, I think Dr. Lichter, who's going to join us, is really going to help you out a great deal. So you'll be hearing that on the Personal Injury Guru Show. This is the Personal Injury Guru Show with attorney David Papa. Welcome back to the Personal Injury Guru. Again, I'm David Papa, and I'm here with my guest, Dr. Bill Lichter. He is a chiropractor. And uh, Bill, why don't you start off by just telling people who you are and, and, and maybe a little bit of background education-wise and what you've been doing. All right. Well, I've been uh, treating patients in a chiropractic setting for 31 years. Uh, actually, originally from New York. And actually, the way this came about was I was actually in law school back in 1985. Wow. And uh, uh, to make a long story short, I became, I had back problems of my own and became a chiropractic patient and got very interested in the whole process. So um, I, did my, I did my undergraduate work, pre-med studies at uh, State University of New York at Binghamton. And um, I went to chiropractic college on Long Island at New York Chiropractic College, and I've been doing this since 1990. Wow, that's a long time. Yeah, it <laughs> goes, <laughs> goes quickly. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. It goes quickly. So th during the, the course of the last 31 years, um, I've, I've done some other postgraduate work and became a, a fellow of the International Academy of Medical Acupuncture back in 98. And um, I was a research assistant in the early 2000s with the, uh, um, the Spine Institute of San Diego. And um, so one of the only organizations in the world that does research um, using not only crash test dummies, but live human volunteers, uh, they did uh, research on rear impact collisions and the mechanics of it and how it, the injuries are created. You know, Bill, I saw that once before. I remember seeing a video on the San Diego Spine Institute, and I remember seeing live people <laughs> jettison forward and abrupt stops and hitting you know, objects, and they measure from the side back and forth, and they measure the, uh, I guess, the different degree of impact and uh, the crush damage to the vehicles and how that affects people. It's pretty amazing. It's it's um, a really little-known science, and... Um, it's interesting if you're able to witness this, witness these cars being crashed at speeds of between 6 and 12 miles an hour. It's astonishing how much impact that right. is. And, and you find scenarios where the, the science of this demonstrates how you can have people injured with disc injuries, nerve root injuries, ligament injuries, and yet sometimes the car doesn't even appear to have it's not that impressive how much property damage there is to the vehicle. And, and that's important. And the, the point I'd like to make here is it's important because a lot of people are getting fender benders. There doesn't appear to be a lot of damage to the vehicle, but you're right. Because the vehicle isn't damaged doesn't mean the person inside the vehicle isn't hurt. Well, that's, it seems as though in the insurance industry, that's the, the adjusters are trained into this um, 
scenario of they call mist minor in minor impact soft tissue injury yes and it's kind of a uh their view of things is well if we don't have cool pictures of a car all smashed up then nobody could probably have been hurt in reality the science there the, the medical research behind it shows there, there really is no correlation between the property damage to the car and the the potential for injury to the uh to the patient. Right, and, and I can attest to that with 20 years of experience at looking at damaged vehicles and speaking to clients. I've seen vehicles with total $30,000, $50,000 worth of damage, and they just have, you know, they're sore and they have a sprain strain. Mm -hmm. I've seen people with, you know, $1,500 worth of property damage and less that have disc injuries and have terrible problems. Right, we see it in the practice all the time. Right. And so uh, my practice um, is in Tampa. We do about a third of the patients that I see are um, injured in car accidents. We do, you know, it's not the entire practice. Uh, we do see people through their health insurance and on a cash basis. But right. um, amongst the people who are injured in auto accidents, a high percentage of them are from rear impacts. And there's reasons for it. It's almost like a Murphy's Law scenario that... Uh, um, a lot of things happen in two or three tenths of a second uh, where the, the head ramps up and sometimes comes over the, over the head restraint and, right. you know, different design features of the car are designed. The cars are really engineered to save lives and seat belts are a great idea and airbags are a great idea. But the, some of the design elements that go towards saving lives actually can really makes uh, soft tissue or connective tissue injuries worse. Right. And I've seen that with airbag deployment. I've seen people that have had terrible facial injuries and lost partial sight. I've seen broken noses, teeth knocked out, and issues like that from the airbag. So, um, yeah, you're right on. Yeah, we have a couple of those right now. I have a, someone who had actually a fractured arm from an, from an airbag. Right. <laughs> no, that's, that's, I mean, I, it's designed to save lives, but there's going to be injury. Yeah, certainly. Sure. You, certainly you'd trade that. Uh, fractured arm for your life. <laughs> I, would too, I would too, my friend. Absolutely. And uh, I don't know where, I don't want to know where to sign up for that crash dummy simulation. I'm yeah. not going to take part. I'm uh, not taking part. Honestly, back. I found it amazing oh. that they, they had um, one of the guys when I was there, this is in San Diego back in 2003, 2004. One of the guys who was a volunteer was apparently a multiple time and, uh, volunteer. Wow. And he was, most of the people taking this um, class were chiropractors or medical doctors. There were a few, he was, this guy was an engineer, actually. He was a, mm -hmm. a biomedical engineer. And uh, you know, why, why anyone would volunteer for this is, is amazing. Yeah, and, it is. Especially considering someone who actually knows some of the research behind it. <laughs> right, right. The only thing I can think of is a movie, Tommy Boy, where uh, Rob Lowe accidentally uh, falls onto the front of that vehicle and it takes off real fast <laughs> and he goes flying. That's what I picture. And yeah, I don't want to be that guy. In incredible it but, is but we we find that um a lot of times in these these impacts um bones hold up well mm -hmm. you know in, in my practice is limited to certain types of conditions right and i don't treat uh broken bones or dislocations i'm not a surgeon uh when we have things that require surgeons or orthopedics you know we refer out to people we're comfortable with and know what right. they're doing but in terms of what i do kind of focuses on the soft tissue injuries which comes down to muscles ligaments joint capsules discs and nerve roots right and and those are the things that are frequently the source of pain in these type of uh, rear impacts or or non-life-threatening type of injuries right and I, and I believe in chiropractic care I've had chiropractic care, and there's been times that I just can't get loose or my back is too tight, or I'm just having this pain that doesn't go in the lower back. It's amazing what chiropractors can really do. Well, you know, everybody has, everybody has their place in it, and people, you know, there are people who say, I believe in it or I don't believe in it. There's really, there's nothing to believe in. Um, you know, we, we, I don't have the answer to everything. And there are people who come into my office with conditions that should be, at a neurologist's office or should be at an orthopedic surgeon's office. And, you know, one of the things is we come across this all the time that people go, oh, I'm kind of a little apprehensive. I heard a chiropractors, you know, are not medical doctors and this and that. You know, like every other profession, I'm sure you know plenty of attorneys 
who manage to get through law school and get law degrees, <laughs> but really don't know what they're doing. And, Every profession has them. And there are surgeons like that, and there are people who are, there are hairstylists like that, and yes. there are auto mechanics like that, and there are, no doubt there are chiropractors that, and you know, one of the things I've discovered over, over you know, 31 years of doing this is that one of the things I think that makes my practice successful and why we have a good reputation is that I know my limits. And that we're going to do things in a proper order. Right. And we're not going to treat a patient until we have qualified them and determined that they belong in our office. So before any treatment is delivered, any chiropractic care or physical therapy or massage, patient is, you know, the patient is going to fill out a complete health history. We're going to get a, an assessment of what, you know, what's the reason they're here. What's their background? Have they had any prior accidents? Do they have any other health conditions? Are they on any medications? Have they had any surgeries in the past? And then we're going to put them through a full, complete um, orthopedic, neurological, spinal exam and get some images done. Right. And then we'll take the time to kind of assess it to say, do I think I can help you? Do you belong in my office? And if you don't, then my job is to get you to the right place. But if you do belong in my office, then, and this is where I, I, I've come across this a lot, especially recently, where some of the chiropractic offices fall short. And that is to come up with a plan, to have a treatment plan and have a set of goals and to reassess frequently so that you deliver a certain amount of care and then determine, is the care helping the patient? And if it's not, what can we do differently? Can we change our course of action? Can we refer out for other tests? Can we refer out to other doctors? And, and that's really how, uh, it's really what's best for the patient, but it's right. also best for the, it's really best for me as well. It's best for the reputation of the office to know that we're not going to accept you as a patient if we don't think we can help you. Right. And we're going to do everything we can to help you. But if we're doing, if what we're doing isn't working, um, it's not going to go on and on and on. We're going to stop what we're doing and try to figure out what is there a plan B. Right. So well, uh, that's admirable because I know that about you, and for thirty-one years, that's a lot of experience, and uh, and you put that to work in your office, and I think that people should be understanding that if they go to see you, you'll take good care of them, and if you can't help, you'll take them to the right place. Yeah, it's hard, you know. I mean, there, there's nothing you can't. Um, you can't inject experience into somebody, you know, and even someone who's had 10 years, 15 years of practice, I, I, I can confidently say I am better at what I do now than I was after I was doing it for 20 years. Yes. <laughs> no, you know, we, it's funny. We were talking. I was talking to a couple other attorneys about that the other day. And my first, I was uh, actually doing, a, it was a seminar for Cooley Law School. And I was talking to the third year students. And they were asking me questions about, when you first started doing trials, how is it compared to today? Wow. Night and day. Yeah. Experience is everything, as you know. And even as an attorney that does trial work, I'm much more polished now than I was when I first started 20 years ago. And it's the same with you. Well, I came out of chiropractic school, you know, so undergrad, four years of school. And then right. another three and a half years of chiropractic school. When I came out of school... I didn't feel like I was qualified to do anything. Right. Well, um, you were still riding on dinosaurs back then, right? <laughs> right. Was, <laughs> yeah. I had a. Um, I commuted in, with a horse and buggy actually uh, <laughs> on the uh, Long Island Expressway, but uh, <laughs> the. the um, but I actually, you know, recognized the fact like I'm not clinically equipped to start working on my own, nor was I equipped. From a business standpoint of well, what how do I open a practice so I actually worked for other people the first year I got out of school and um, I actually worked in this clinic in um, upstate New York for six months that was a um, massive massive operation there were five doctors there mm -hmm. there were about 12 staff we were seeing close to 1200 patient visits a week there Wow and so in that office I feel like I feel like I got ten years experience in six months there. <laughs> right. um, I also learned a lot there, not just about how to do chiropractic and how to assess a patient, how to conduct a consultation exam. I, I learned a lot about how not to practice there also because they were um, they were very pushy, very salesy. 
Um, mm -hmm. it, was a, it, it was an operation there, but I, I learned a lot of things about how not to do it. And then I practiced on Long Island for uh, four years and then decided to move to Florida and kind of started all over again. Right. And then when I came down to Florida, um, I wound up working for a, a couple of offices, one in Tampa and one in St. Pete, where I learned even more about how not to practice. <laughs> There's a lot of that going on. And, there. and, and, I will not deny it, and in fact, uh, you know, there's there's no doubt there. You have to be careful out there about who who you hire as of not only as your attorney but your chiropractor. Um, there there are certain things you want to be on the lookout for in right. a chiropractic office. Well, you know, Bill, I've always told everyone that I know it's best to hire experience in every profession, uh, and I say that because of what we've been talking about. You learn not just what to do and how to do it better, but what to stay away from, and that's important. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Well, there's also there's also this thing called honesty and integrity, and there there are people with yeah. experience who you need to stay away from. Also, <laughs> got to be careful uh, of those guys too, right? It it it, it truly is. But um, you know, I I kind of really take the approach with it that I don't have the answers to everything. And I don't think that a spine surgeon is the answer to everything. And I don't think that a pain management doctor has the answers to everything. But if we, you know, we work together and we've got a team, team of doctors that we've, you know, kind of come across over the years that yes, we um, a lot of my patients, um, you know, a lot of my patients get better and their care is mostly focused to what we do in our office, which is... Um, it's chiropractic, it's physical therapy, it's massage, it's exercise rehabilitation, it's spinal decompression therapy. But there, mm -hmm. there's a subset of patients that are going to have conditions that are going to be more stubborn, more difficult to treat. And so there are occasions where we're going to refer the patient out for MRI imaging, or we're going to refer the patient out for pain management. And there's patients, you know, I've got a a handful of patients every year that wind up getting referred to, you know, neurosurgery or orthopedic surgery. Right. So, you know, I think the the strength of our practice is knowing our limits, knowing when it's time to make the right referral and working as a team to, you know, recognize the fact that we're not going to fix everything. Right. And, um, you know, there are people who do well with surgery and there are people who don't need surgery so you just have to kind of be able to identify who's who you know well let me ask you go into automobile accidents when you first see a patient in your office um as an attorney my concern is always you knowing their background you knowing the fact they may have been in other accidents they may have previous mris sitting out there chiropractors have treated them before do you find that that is some of the most useful information you can get is someone's background? Well, it's it's the most useful information. You know, mm -hmm. you know, in medicine, whether you're a chiropractor, a surgeon, a veterinarian, or a dentist, the number one, a lot of people who are not in medicine don't know this, but the number one diagnostic tool is consultation. That when we, you know, from just from getting paperwork done and asking the right questions and doing a thorough consultation, that's what's going to give you a diagnostic impression. Right. Things like x-rays, MRIs, CAT scans, nerve conduction studies, a lot of times, although we, we use those things to rule out other conditions, rule out things like pathologies and tumors and fractures, um, a lot of times though the imaging is actually there to just confirm what we're already feeling. So, you know, consultation is, it's the biggest tool we have. And taking the time on the first visit to really listen to the patient is, is the, you know, the most important thing we do. That's why I brought that up because throughout my years, the first thing I've always told my, my clients is before we discuss what type of uh, doctor we should send them to and what types of injuries that they're going to be treating with, I always say, please be upfront and honest with the doc. Make sure they know your background history. Make sure they understand that you've already had an injury to this area of the body or you've had treatment or other testing in the past because I knew how big consultation is. And you know, it's not, I mean, you know this better than anyone, it's not just important from a, from a medical, a diagnostic and treatment standpoint. It's important for the a medical legal standpoint too. Like the worst thing that could happen in your case is a patient <laughs> tries to, the patient tries to d cover up the fact that he's had previous accidents and previous cases, yep. and then it comes out in discovery or deposition. Yeah, well, and see, then, now that you're getting into my area, I'll, yeah. I'll add that. I'll yeah. say, yes, 
I always tell my clients, be upfront and be honest at all times because no matter what happens, if you're honest with the doctors, you'll get good medical records and down the road, I will not be surprised. I said, I don't do well with surprises. I want you to be honest. And if people are honest up front with me and they sit down and they're honest and up front with you about their history, you have great records. It gives me great records and everything goes smooth. And the thing is, it's, you know, everyone has to understand, listen, you get injured in a car crash and you're in your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, your 60s. No one expects you to be a perfectly conditioned Olympic athlete. I mean, you're, <laughs> there, there's going to be pre-existing conditions, but that doesn't yeah. mean you. That doesn't mean that you don't have a case or that you weren't injured in this crash. Um, in fact, a lot of the medical literature demonstrates that people with degenerative discs, pre-existing conditions, they're more likely to get hurt. You right. know, it's kind of like that fragile egg syndrome. If you have a, right. if you have four people in a car and you have, you know, mom, dad, a kid, and grandma, grandma is the one who's going to be most likely to get injured. She doesn't have the full range of motion. The, you know, joints are more mm -hmm. brittle and more likely to be injured. And in the legal profession, we call that the glass jaw client. Yeah. You could come up and punch four people in the jaw, but that one guy that just doesn't have the jaw that's just right, his is going to break. So yeah. I understand what you're talking about, and you're right. Yeah. But, um, you know, I think a lot of, um, th there's a lot of um, misunderstanding and there's a lot of, um, I don't know, I don't think a lot of people know a lot about chiropractic profession. Right. And people think of it as in its, its old school um, kind of thing, a hands-on joint manipulation. Are you going to crack my neck? And are you going to pop my back? And are you a real yeah. doctor? And, you know, in, in reality... Um, Everything we do is backed up by medical research. And, um, you know, there are people who are apprehensive and there are people who, um, you know, are really, you know, worried about, oh, are you going to hurt me? I mean, I, I didn't really <laughs> make a living for 31 years from hurting people. Right. And course. so we have to kind of identify, like I said, on the first visit, we've got to identify what's wrong with you. Um, do you belong in this office? What is the proper kind of care for you yep. and how long is it going to take and you know, how often are we going to do it? And not everybody is going to be manually uh, manipulated or popped or cracked. You know, maybe 60, 65 percent of the patients in my office, my practice tends to be lean to skew younger. I treat a lot of people in their 20s, 30s, 40s and 50s. And it's not that I don't treat 60s, 70s, and 80s, but I just don't seem to treat a lot of those folks. Right. So, we, you know, we do treat athletes, so we do treat teenagers. You'd be surprised every year how more and more, more and more 15, 16, 17-year-olds are in my practice. Wow. And it's, you know, a lot of it has to do with things like cell phones and texting and computers. That's and a video good games. point. Sure, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and also, I want to mention you brought along a little demonstrative aid with you. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you could, why don't you, uh, you brought two with you, why don't you just, um, of course, talk to the, uh, the viewers that are actually visually seeing you, but there's also people that are just going to be hearing you on audio as well. So kind of explain what you have, what yeah. you're talking about. So, you know, a lot of people think of a chiropractor as being a back doctor or a, or a bone doctor. Right. And really, um, the more accurate way to describe what I do is we're really specialists in the nervous system. So if you were to try to kind of come up with what specialty in medicine is most closely associates with chiropractic, it would be neurology more than orthopedics. And okay. so the way, you know, the way your nervous system, which your nervous system controls and coordinates the function of everything else in your body. Your nervous system really is three things. It's your brain, your spinal cord, and the nerve, the nerves that um, branch off of your spinal cord. So the right. way your spine is, it just happens that your nervous system is housed in your skull and in your spine. So the way the spine is set up is you've got 24 uh, bones that are called vertebrae. And in between each pair of bones is a cushion called a disc. And you have these nerve roots that come out from an opening that's formed by a bone above and below. So when we're evaluating a patient, we're evaluating range of motion, we're evaluating, and we're checking these different nerve roots. Okay. So nerves control muscles, nerves control organs, glands, and blood vessels, and nerves also give you the ability to feel things, feel things like pain or tingling or numbness. So 
we're looking not only for the idea of does this person have a fracture or dislocation or a muscle or a strain or a sprain, but we're looking for alignment in the spine. And then we're also looking to see if any of these discs um, have been injured. So, you know, a disc is a specialized kind of cartilage. Right. And there's two components to it. There are these fibers on the outside and then there's this gel on the inside. So a normal disc is just going to kind of create a cushion between two bones and it's going to provide space for the nerve to come out. Sometimes in car accidents, we'll see like what's called a herniated disc or a disc protrusion. And that's where some of this gel on the inside has um, protruded out because there's been tears in the annular fibers. So that, that herniation can mechanically irritate the nerve. So you see here on the, on the normal side, the nerve root has plenty of space to exit the spine and the disc is not encroaching into that opening. Where here, you've got both mechanical and chemical irritation to the nerve root. So you see now the nerve has swelled up. So these are people, if this happens in your neck, you're gonna have symptoms down the arm. Uh, you're gonna have pain down the arm or tingling, numbness, or even weakness in the hands. And if this happened in your lower back, this can give you like sciatica. This can give you numbness, tingling, or pain down the legs. Right. So, you know, it is our job. We kind of identify these things um, through consultation and physical exam, and then we confirm them with MRI. So like the, the discs we don't see on x-ray. We'll see, we can see the space that they occupy. So we can see, we can determine or diagnose a degenerated disc or a thinning disc on an x-ray. But to see the disc, we need to, we need to order an MRI. There are certain pa subgroups of patients that can't have an MRI because they've got medical implants, pacemakers, or different kinds of metal implants. And sometimes we can use CAT scan uh, with, you know, in those cases to, okay. to visualize the disc. So you know, we do treat disc injuries, that's, and that's another common misconception. Um, I treat disc injuries all day long in my office. And you know, one of the things to, uh, I think it's important to point out, because I've come across this a lot in 30 years, people go, well, you know, I went to my medical doctor and he said I have a muscle spasm. And your medical, do your medical doctor, your primary care physician is a, is a generalist. And um, while well, he might spend his day treating a sore throat and his next patient might have diabetes and the patient after that might have asthma. I spend my entire 31 years treating spines. Uh, you know, 90% of what I do all day is just necks and backs. I do see, right. see shoulder problems, knee problems, elbow problems as well, but not, at least 90% of what I do is spines. So we're, we're, you're not, I, I'm, not see, I'm not spending parts of my day seeing sore throats and right. asthma. No, it's 100% on the spine. So we're, we're a specialist, that. and um, you know, it's disc injuries, though. Are, when people think of a herniated disc, they think, oh, you have to go see a surgeon. 2% of the people with disc herniations wind up in surgery. Right. Um, you know, a lot of them can be rehabilitated with through chiropractic care, through exercise rehab, through spinal decompression therapy and, and, and home exercise. So, you know, my job really is to evaluate the patient and try to get them better without drugs and surgery. Right. But right. my job is also to know when drugs and when surgery are appropriate and do what's best for the patient. Very good. Well, at this point, I would like to thank you very much for coming by because that is excellent information. And you've explained what a chiropractor does, what they shouldn't do, and the fact that you're open-minded. You know your limitations, which is huge. So uh, I'd just like to thank you, Bill, Thanks very for much. Me. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and I'd like to have you again sometime. Uh, at this point, um, we will be back in a short period of time to the personal injury guru. Again, this is the personal injury guru and you had heard from Dr. Bill Lichter. And um, as I suspected, he covered a lot of information about what chiropractors really do. Um, I'm hoping that was very informative because that is really my goal. After 20 years of practicing law, I find that many people simply don't know what chiropractors are up to and what types of work they do on people. 
Um, Bill Lichter has got 31 years of experience, and he told you exactly what he can and can't do. He's an excellent doctor. I try to work with these types of doctors because it's very important that you, the viewers, who really don't know what a chiropractor does, can find out this way. So if, uh, if you really like the show, give me a thumbs up, subscribe to me. If you have any questions or concerns or you'd like to be on the show, don't, or if you have an idea for the show, I would, I'd be willing to listen to you. Um, just go to the uh, Papa Injury Law website, and uh, also you can email me at dpapa at injury, uh, papainjurylawyer.com, and I'll be happy to respond to you. And again, I hope this was informative. My goal is to show that I'm just a regular guy doing this work after 20 years, but I want to teach people, and I want people to learn about the different types of doctors that they're going to be seeing, including Dr. Bill Lichter, who's here today.